Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the OLC's webinar, Program Effectiveness, How the Dashboard Can Help You, presented by Alan Middleton. I'm Allison Mullen. I'm the Manager of Communications and Marketing at the OLC, although currently you may see my name on the dashboard as Leslie Brown. <laughs> I just had a few technical difficulties, but everything seems to be going smoothly now. Um, before we get started and I introduce Alan, I just want to give you a few instructions. At the right-hand side of the, of the uh, screen is your dashboard. There you can kind of talk to each other, ask questions um, in either the question or the chat pane. If it's a technical question, I'll answer it and try to assist you. Um, if it's a question pertaining to the topic um, that Alan's presenting, ask it at any time, and Alan will uh, address the question at the end of the webinar. Um, and if you'd like to participate on Twitter, just use the hashtag OLCWeb, and uh, we'll, we'll try to uh, track what everyone's saying as well. Now to introduce our presenter. Alan Middleton is the Executive Director of the Schulich Executive Education Center, which runs non-degree programs for over 16,000 executives and managers a year in North America and internationally. Uh, internationally. Alan co-authored the book, Advertising Works 2, Iconica, a field guide to Canada's brandscape. He published papers on marketing, communications ROI, client agency compensation strategies, and client agency relations. Um, in 2005, he was inducted to the Canadian Marketing Hall of Legends in the Mentor category. He's also involved on boards and board committees with ABC Life Literacy Canada, Sunnybrook Hospitals, the Ontario Tourism Marketing Partnership, and the Royal Ontario Museum, among others. So um, from now, I'm going to pass it over to Alan to get started, and I uh, hope everyone enjoys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can uh, uh, hope everybody can hear me. Um, so here, put that back. Um, here's the deal for everybody. Um, everything that I do well and that you like, thank Leslie. Everything I do badly and isn't any use, just blame me. Um, so don't, don't hold Leslie responsible for this. Um, what we're going to do is talk about a, a technique of pulling together uh, assessment of program performance that's rapidly caught on really in, in the last five or six years. And, and I'll take you through um, the background to it. So our objectives today are to introduce you to the dashboard as a tool for checking the effectiveness of programs, describe a little bit of how it works and its measures, though obviously in our broadcast we're not going to be able to go into the details. And we'll use marketing and marketing communications as examples, but I will show you a, a, a couple um, of ideas of how to work uh, um, some things in the literacy field. We'll talk very briefly about how to develop a program dashboard and, and then answer a bunch of questions. So let's, let's kick off. Oh, and, and I'll handle everybody's questions toward the end. Um, and if Alan Kay's uh, on the line, uh, no questions from Alan. Um, so where's the ancestry of this? All, undoubtedly all of you know about the balanced scorecard, um, which was uh, developed in 1996 as an attempt to get organizations to think about more than just financial outcomes for its system. It was trying to get any organization, whether it was a private sector government or not for profit, to think more strategically about what its measures of performance and success were. And the original authors identified four areas that needed tracking. Finance, obviously, customer and consumer and uh, based uh, responses, the how well business processes and learning were going in the organization, and how to track growth. What came out of that was a whole industry, really, um, that developed performance scorecards and dashboards. And, and I won't go into boring definitions, but just to let you know, uh, almost the phrases scorecards and dashboards are almost used interchangeably. Um, notionally, a scorecard is a listing of achievement versus goals, and a dashboard tends to be more over time and graphic, but honestly, I read 10 books about this and the definitions all overlap. The real point is what they attempt to do in any area of an organization is to track 
performance over time and against goals. It's like a dashboard on a car, a boat or a plane, because I know we've got online a whole bunch of uh, affluent people who love going and flying their private planes. And really, it's, it's uh, instruments that establish the condition of the car. Have you got enough oil? Have you got enough gasoline? And what the external environment is. So it rains on come the windscreen wipers or the lights or, or whatever it is. In uh, operations sense, the dashboard contains the information to help guide and maintain the direction and condition of your programs. And as I said, I've chosen marketing programs as an example. So it will have key measures, and yes, we'll talk about those in a minute, um, that need to be regularly tracked to determine whether what we're doing is actually achieving its ends. Here's the quotation um, from uh, one of the writers about the uh, dashboard. Um, it translates the organization strategy into objectives, metrics, initiatives, and tasks customized to each group in the organization. So imagine in your head, overall, uh, there may be a balanced scorecard which sets key measures for the whole organization. But then it breaks down into dashboards either on a department basis or on a project basis. And as I said, in, in a minute or two, I'll, I'll show you some examples from ABC Life Literacy, the group I'm engaged with. Um, in how that might work in, in looking at programs. Three roles. Um, it monitors business processes and activities and kicks up, and I'll show you the graphics in a minute, when you're below where you wanted to be. It helps you analyze, and this is the real value of, of, of dashboards. Um, it, it, instead of just saying, oh, uh, we didn't make our targets, or not, not people signed up, or we haven't got enough material out um, to our, our literacy providers, um, what it does is because of all the information that's contained there, um, it starts the, the, giving you the ability of analyzing what's going on. And the D, and you'll notice that it's M-A-D, MAD, which I wish they'd come up with a better acronym, um, it gets you into the detail. Um, so you'll look at an overall chart of what's happening, um, but then you'll get into the detail of how you measure it. So you can really develop fact-based conclusions of what's going on. So marketing dashboard, graphic map that allows an observable or modeled relationship. I'll come to that a bit later, but what we really mean here is and it's why I like graphics. Even if you either don't have the money or the skill or the desire to develop nifty mathematical uh, models, just looking at the inputs, some measures, and how you're doing against outputs graphically will begin to give you a sense of what's going on and how effective um, uh, your programs are being. Um, a lot of organizations in marketing or in programs try to calculate ROIs. Uh, any of you know anything much about the real definition of ROI? No, even accountants and finance people recognize that only appeals to a very narrow um, group of um, comparisons that you can make between two like things, so avoid that. What it also does is get over the fact that we assume linear relationships. We all know um, that doing anything to get people to do things, whether it's an attitude change or whether it's a behavior change, is nonlinear. You, you don't go out and run ads or run conferences or create brochures or create programs and expect automatically there to be a direct linkage with people changing attitude or behavior. It doesn't work that way. And what the dashboard allows you to do is to look at the combination of things that affect what you're doing and allow you to see over time what the effects might be. It, it won't be nice and neat as direct as you know, a linear relationship. We do this, this happens. It'll be a little more complex. Dashboard helps you get there. 
here's what often happens, and, and again I'll, I'll use marketing as an example. Often we too often stop at what are called interim metrics, and you'll see on the chart that the performance scorecard people tend to call these drivers. What you're trying to get at is if you do something, what is the outcome and how important is that of driving you towards the real goal? So for instance in marketing, you might say I do something to improve customer satisfaction. You know, I, I walk into a store, I've trained my staff, and so what I'm going to measure is how happy the customer is because of the satisfaction developed by having trained the staff. So my interim measure will be customer satisfaction. But is that what the store's in business for? No, the store's in business to sell things, and to sell things not at a constant discount, but at a way they can make a regular margin. So they're making the assumption, often based on research, that if I improve customer satisfaction when I go into the bay, for instance, um, that people are going to come there more often, another interim measure, and when they're there, they're actually going to feel so comfortable and so happy with the staff that they're going to buy stuff without it being discounted. So in this commercial model, the input measure would be staff training. The interim measure would be customer satisfaction scores, but the output measure, what you're really trying to achieve, would be increase in sales or margin or repeat purchase. And what the dashboard will allow you to do is to track what activities you spent at the input measures, the staff training, how that affected levels of customer satisfaction, and then over time, did it actually affect the output? In other words, the sales or the margin or the repeat visit. Dashboards don't answer everything. You'll have a whole bunch of questions you'll want to answer about um, organizational issues, um, about whether the effectiveness of advertising, with the effectiveness of a particular brochure, which will be outside of the dashboard. So this isn't a one solution fits all, all your needs. What it does do is to put everything in an effectiveness link. What I do, what my interim measures are, and what my outcome measures are. Here's an example for marketing. Input measure in marketing activity could be a whole bunch of things. It could be doing things. It could be the spending. It could be how much you charge and pricing what your coverage and distribution is, what the amount of marketing communication is, advertising, its share of voice, and so on. How do you measure this? Well, there's a series in the industry of classic brand metrics. What's my awareness? How many people actually know I exist? And then secondly, what are the associations? What do they think of me? You know, one of the interesting little asides, by the way, in marketing communication, because a lot of people think all they have to do is build awareness. Well, if I come across and meet you all and hit you on your nose, I will have increased my awareness with you, but you won't ever want to see me again. Marketing communications is, is intended not only to get you aware of a service or a product or a program, but also to get you to think favorably about it so that you, you want to engage. You might measure whether I intend to buy, um, what my frequency, what my share of purchases. And those of you outside marketing, the net promoter score that's on this chart is basically would I recommend it to my friends. Often that's where people stop, but that's not really where you want to stop. You want to move over to the column on the right, because what you want is those interim measures, the driver metrics, to result in what your real end objectives are, which is business and brand building. So the key in the dashboard is input, intermediary or driver metrics, and as it relates to the output metrics, and that's what you will graph. That's what you'll put up with the data on a dashboard. Here's another example for marketing communications. 
here you're not looking at total marketing effort, you're not looking at pricing and distribution, you're just looking at marketing communication, advertising, uh, digital or social media, um, uh, promotion, sponsorship, all this kind of stuff. Some of your interim measures are very much the same. You're also looking at awareness and associations, but you might also be looking at associations with the specific creative message. And then a whole bunch of areas that pop up through social media and digital, um, with websites and everything else. How many clicks, how many fans am I attracting? How many people are recommending me? What's the level of engagement? But again, what you're interested in is the shift between those intermediary driver metrics and their effect on your end goals. Here's one graphic example. Don't worry about the details. I just put it up there to show you the graphs. You see some of the measures and, and what it puts up in graphic form, and it allows you to hone in on any individual detail to get a little more detail, get a little more information. Here's another one. Um, here's where you might start off with your, your, a basic graph of what's happened to you over time. But then you're going in and you're looking a little more detail. So you'll see what's happened in the example. Let me go back again. Here's your basic uh, sales curve. And you say, oh, I wonder what's happening at the time this is happening. And there we go. It just happens at one of the peaks that you'll see. Um, there's a, a, a lot of activity going on. We've shaded out the actual dollars for confidentiality. But this is what was going on with media, which align with some of the peaks. So you go, oh, maybe my media is working where the bars are, and it always seems to drive the peaks. But gee, have you noticed it may drive the peaks in the short term, but it doesn't seem to be sustaining. So let's look at what else is happening in this case. Let's look at price. So what happens to the prices over the time? Let's happen to any added value. In this case, they're also offering air miles. So you see what we're doing? We've taken that basic sales curve. In the previous chart, we've looked at what was happening in marketing communications. And then in this chart, what we've looked at, we built in some of the other activities like pricing. Here's another one. We've now added in um, page views on web hits. So we're adding in what's happened with our web. So we're gradually building this total picture of what caused those sales beats, what was going on at the time, and what seems to be working. Here's a summary. Um, that you want. This is a vehicle classification chart. And I'm just using it that you, you don't really dwell on the content. But this starts looking at where you're spending. You see the graph going down on the slight right of the pie chart of how much you're actually allocating segment by segment. And you're tying that back to where your performance was um, on, on the charts. So it's enabling you to go in looking at all the stuff you were doing and going, you know, when we did more of that, we seemed to hit a bigger peak and it lasted longer. It's getting you to think about what, what your returns are, what, what might be causing your success. How do you spend the performance peaks? Here's another one. Um, you can do a rolling annual average um, with sales or performance or number of people coming to seminars or whatever your measure is. So another way you want to do it over time is compare what actually happened, the performance beats, with here, what you might expect to happen based on existing trends. And then again, you're adding in, uh, trying to find what was going on here. In this case, it was activity with couponing and investment to give money off at the, at the trade. So was that what, what was causing? Let's look at what we're doing in marketing communication. Um, we're looking at little here, a mixture of cinema and transit and outdoor. Again, I'm not going to dwell on the detail. I just want to give you the idea of how, go back a little, a simple chart that you may have in other forms. Here's what was going on with my key objective, the output measure. 
And here I begin to understand the interim measures um, and the input measures. What was I doing and what was I achieving by some of those? Here's another example. Um, if you run some models, here's might be a performance you expect. And if you test a limited price offer, uh, will it try, will it achieve my own targets? So you've got a new baseline and whoops, not too far. So you're testing hypotheses. So summarize before we go on and, and move into programs. All this is think. Input, what am I doing? Whether it's marketing, whether it's advertising, whether it's running a program. Interim measures are the important ones. That's why we sometimes call them driver measures. What have they achieved? If building awareness of my programs is critical, then that will be one of the interim measures. But you don't want to just stop at the, at the awareness. You want to find out whether that awareness of the programs actually results into anybody actually doing anything about it, which is attending the programs. So that's what this enables in a graphic form with the ability to load the data in. I'm going to talk about a couple of examples. And by the way, um, thank you to my friends at uh, ABC Life Literacy. We have not dashboarded these yet, but here's how we might do it. And, and yes, we're, we're talking to some folks there about whether we've got the data to set this up. So let me take you through of what we might do. So most of you online will be aware of the fact that since 1999, we basically had an event in January, towards the end of January, called Family Literacy Day. And the notion's very simple. We want to focus parents on reading to their kids, to get them used to um, uh, reading as, as, as a form of learning and as to improve their literacy. So the input for that program, we'd look at how much gets out there in terms of point of sale through our partners, how much advertising gets out there to say, 27th Family Literacy Day, read to your kids. Um, last year was a journey to learning passport that we promoted. We had the website. We had the previous years great cooperation from our partners like Honda up until recently and, and going back a little way Coca-Cola. So what you'd be adding up for the input as you put it on the dashboard is how much activity was going on in this case to promote the program. Okay, how would we measure that? The intermediary or the driver measures would be how many people are aware out there that is Family Literacy Day. Now, this is aimed at basically a target group of parents with kids in order to get them reading. Within that, we might have more specific targets of, of those who have challenges or difficult to reach groups. We'd build that in. What are the associations about it? Um, is this a good idea? Um, does it appeal to people? We might also measure, uh, uh, interim measures, uh, the number of um, sponsors we've got, and how, public relations, how much media value but if that's all we measure, we're not really achieving our objective, are we? Because what we want to graph is how all that money spent on building um, behind Life Family Literacy Day and all those metrics, did it actually result in people doing anything? So one of the measures we might want is a survey, a um, sample survey, obviously you couldn't do it everywhere. What, what do we expect in terms of the number of people actually reading um, to their kids 15 minutes a day? How many people then, here's the real target, go on and do it regularly? And go, hey, this is kind of cool, I should do this, so there's a way to do it. Or do it with other people, not just their families. And then any research relationship with ongoing reading ability. Now, we've got other um, research that says, yes, there is that if you can get kids from a very young age into activities with their parents, where reading and learning words, and learning articulation becomes part of their lives, there is an ongoing effect. But you'd actually want to measure it. So if you think back to the charts I've just shown you, what you'd want to do is on that dashboard, 
put in what are you doing, what are your interim metrics, and how is it relating um, to people actually doing things? Are we achieving goals? Here's another example. Also, thank you to Life Literacy. Um, as most of you will know, we've had Learn or Look Under Learn um, on the yellow pages or online since 1994. The notion has been to allow Canadians to quickly and easily access contact information for their local literacy organization. We kind of wanted to set up a signpost to where they can find um, literacy skills. So again, using the same kind of measures. The input measures would be how many yellow page listings, how complete across Canada is it, how up to date is the information, how much money are we putting behind telling people if they know anybody who has this uh, as a challenge, we know where they can go because they can find it fairly easily, either in hard copy, um, yellow pages, or now look under learn.ca. So you measure how much of your input, how much money and activity you're spending to get people to be aware of this program. So what would be the interim measures? Well, um, you'd want to measure how many of the people who might have the challenge will actually call and find out. Um, where, but that's not enough. It's not just the, the calling we want. We want them to go on to be encouraged to call and actually do something. So as you'll see, the interim measures are number of people calling, number of potential learners feeling encouraged to call. That's the association. We don't want them just to be aware of it. We want them to be aware and say, OK, I can take the next step. I can pick up the phone. But what we're also trying to get is some <coughs> general public awareness and respect for the initiative. But if you think about it, that's not the end point. The end point is, have we encouraged people to recommend potential learners, either to do it themselves or through their friends, actually to contact their local literacy organizations to take literacy programs? And then, are they feeling supported as, as a result of that? So again, think of the dashboard. What we'd measure here would be what we're doing to promote learn and look under learn. How many people we've actually got calling, in other words, responding and the fact we're there. But then the outcome measures are really about are we attracting people to go to the great local literacy organizations around Canada to do something. So that's really what it is. So this can be applied to programs. It can be applied to um, uh, your marketing communication activity. It can be really applied to anything where what you're trying to measure is activity, an interim measure, and a goal. So let me take you through the stages and then talk about some of the, 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 the ways in how we start this. Um, what we can do, at the mostly what people do at the beginning is they've just got general reports. Level two is they'll occasionally measure some interim stuff. I'll use an example. This will sound a strange example, but uh, this is milk marketing in the prairies. And uh, when we first started helping them put together a dashboard, they knew how much milk they sold and how much money they spent promoting milk. And a very key target group for milk is teenagers, because teenagers think milk is for non-teenagers, in other words, young kids. Teenagers think of themselves as either in the soft drink world or the beer world. So what milk marketing tries to do is to say to teenagers, hey, this is it's really cool to drink milk even though you're 15. So they spend a bunch of stuff doing marketing communications to aim at that. And what they'll try to do is they'll create ads, and they'll spend money on a website or advertising. You'll see a bunch of it even in Ontario. So they'll say, OK, let's do that and let's measure it. OK, we find out that we reached 30% of people with our ads and that 20% were aware of what we're doing. Oh, gee. 
you know, can we draw a direct conclusion between the two and where's the output objective? So we need to move to level three, which is a regular collection on a project focus basis, but then gradually link it to output metrics. I'll use another milk example. This one was aimed at not teenagers, but families with kids. And what the Alberta milk marketing people fit were doing, for instance, level two, they were measuring how many recipe books they sent out. They do lots of recipe books. They send out recipe books saying, here's how you use milk to improve your, your, your cooking. And they were measuring how many recipe books they sent out. Ah, problem. They, they weren't at level three because, or four because they weren't collecting any, even any interim data. They were measuring how many books they sent out, but they weren't measuring whether, firstly, anybody read them. Or if they read them, were they actually using it to guide their cooking and using more milk? Let alone when you move to level four, which is to say, by sending the recipe books out and getting people to cook more, did this actually increase the amount of milk that people used or purchased? So you find when you go back in um, to a lot of the data that, that you collect to evaluate programs, we tend to have lots of stuff about what we do. A little bit of stuff about the immediate effect, in other words, the interim data, but we don't systematically drive it to say, gee, what was the impact on what we're really trying to achieve, the output data? And that's why um, we do it. And by the time you get to level five, you can begin, you've got enough data, you can do some predictive modeling. But you know, we don't need to go there. So the way we develop is we've got to learn which ones are important for you, which measures, which align closely with what you're trying to do, and what are those interim measures, and that becomes the key. So how do we start? Um, well, pull together a group to do it. Okay, and, and what this will do is it will look at all your current activity. If, if you're a big organization, you may have measures going back over two or three years. Um, of stuff that you've done and what kind of measures you did. I would expect, and by the way, this is no different in the not-for-profit world, the government world, or the commercial world. The commercial world's not way ahead of people on this stuff, believe me. You'll have lots of data on what we did, a little bit of data on the interim measures. Gee, we achieved X awareness. We got a number of people saying they were interested in attending our programs but we, we haven't linked it to those output measures. What the dashboard allows us to do, when we've got those measures, we can begin to graph them over time and, and look what are the relationships over time. Even if we don't model it, just visually, we begin to learn. Hopefully that, that I showed you with some of the early charts talking about marketing. What you do at phase two is you plan to collect the data. So, for instance, go back to my Alberta milk example. What they decided to do was, in addition to uh, measuring how many recipe books they sent out, they actually set up a sample survey of how many people actually used the recipe books and then did a little bit of tracking for a while after they found people who used the books how many, what happened to their purchasing habits? Were they just using the same amount of milk in a different way, or did it encourage them to use more milk? It cost them the same, believe it or not, because they shifted the research money from measuring something else to measuring the totality of that. Keep in mind, input, interim measure, output model. Then you can move to phase three, which is, you know, what are the important measures in what you're trying to measure? And think back to ABC, what I showed you earlier. So what are your programs? What are your key interim measures? What are you really trying to achieve? Can I measure that? And then how do I find ways to follow on to get that output measure? So look at your overall objectives program objectives and then which measures and drivers work to those and you start tracking them. Next section, I'm always done, I'll answer lots of questions, so I'm going to call work in progress because is this easy? 
<laughs> I wish it was. So I've called this section Hints and Horrors. Um, what works? What are the problems we've had by people doing this stuff? Any of you have ever been through a balanced scorecard process? No, there is a trap because you go, I've got to measure this, I've got to measure this, I've got to measure this. And I've known commercial organizations <coughs> that have figured out they need about 5,000 different measures. And they build departments and research programs to measure it all. And oh God, it drives everybody crazy and people fall out of love with it and they stop using it and it goes away. They just drown in numbers or cost. The way to get around this is to be really strict and, and frankly, one of the things, for instance, I told Alberta uh, milk marketing people, don't measure the number of recipe books you send out because that's not very consequential. Uh, what are your major activities in terms of achieving what you really want? Go back to the teenage example. How, what of the hot button to get teenagers to consume a little more milk? Measure those things. A lot of this you can do by judgment or what a lot of organizations do, trial and error. So which are the key drivers? And also, by the way, which is needed at which level of your organization? By and large, people responsible for programs need more detail. People more senior in the organization need less detail. As I've seen, input measures will be more available than driver or output measures. We tend to know what we spend and what activity we do. By and large, we're not as good at measuring the effect. Do them consistently because the more you get a track record over time, as I showed you in some of the dashboard charts earlier, the more you develop trend lines. And changes in trend lines are a wonderful clue to, ooh, have I done something differently to improve it or to account for a decline? And then KISS. Keep it simple, stupid. Um, it sounds very complicated. And at a very complex and sophisticated level, it can be. But honestly, think, what are the important measures? What do I do to get to those measures? And how do those measures relate to what I really want to achieve in my goals? That's the key. Keep it simple. Stupid. So there's the dashboard. It measures key activities and results. It graphically shows those. And we know, by the way, there was a wonderful article written as far back as the 1950s, which has been replicated since. The, you know that old adage, a picture is worth a thousand words? Well, there was an article written by a Danish professor who did a what's called a meta-analysis of all research about visuals versus words. And the title of his article was, a visual is worth 3,960 words because he'd found on average across cultures, visuals communicate between two and four times more effectively than individual words. Some cultures it's four times, in other cultures it's two times. North America, be you're interested, we're about three times. So having them graphically, having those, those charts that I uh, talked about, rather than just a list of scores, really has, has an important effect. Secondly, it forces you to, or thirdly, it forces you to the systematic approach. We don't just stop at the input measures. We don't just stop at the interim or driver measures. It forces us over time to look how those two things relate to what we really want to achieve. Fourth, you learn the interconnection between the activities. It may not be linear. And this is where I say the value of the graphic is so strong. You know, if we get very sophisticated about this, you'll be doing modeling. You know, you're, you're bunging the regression models and, and doing the usual. But honestly, just physically looking at a dashboard and being able to go in like I did earlier with some of those measures, You'll go, you know, every time we do this, nothing happens immediately, but you know, two or three months later, something happens. Wow, you know, maybe I should go and find out what's going on. So just visually, it prompts you to think about effectiveness. 
and then you measure and you talk about feedback. So net net, it'll help you make more program evaluation better. So so that's that's the burbling. I mean, what I what I wanted to try to do with this was not so much instruct you all how to make a dashboard. Um, I, I can help other people afterwards uh, head in that direction. But to stimulate the thinking about a dashboard as you go and um, think about your program. So let me graphically go back. Um, I'm about to try to go back, but it's stuck. Because um, what I want to leave up is the two ABC um, levels. There we go. And, and so let me just to finish off, go back here. So here's how the process looks. Here's how a dashboard looks. And here's a couple of examples, ABC Life Literacy, that we could turn into a dashboard. So let me pause there. And now I can take you off mute. And, and answer some questions. Hi, Alan. Hi there. Back on. Um, okay, we have a, a few questions here. Um, one is, how do you measure human behaviors? For example, uh -huh. reading 15 minutes a day. <laughs> good question. Um, it, that's a very good question because I have an obvious answer, um, but the answer's uh, not complete. The obvious answer is you go and ask people. You do a sample survey. Have you done it on? not do you intend to do it or not but then of course the legitimate question that then pops up is well just because people say they do it does that mean they're actually doing it which is the eternal problem of all surveys now there is a way of getting around that um, that you set up a panel and you actually go visit them and say you know show me your reading 15 minutes a day in other words you track the behavior Nobody's going to actually, well, you might get big government money to allow you to do that. But the straight answer to your question, imperfect though it is, is you ask them, did you read to your children yesterday? How long was it? Great. Um, next question. Sorry, I have to scroll up to find it here. Uh, the number of programs available is a bit overwhelming. What program software would you recommend a small organization use to introduce a dashboard to track an event? Good question. Um, I'd do two things. Uh, firstly, I'd say, what is my dominant, most important program that I run in this organization? Um, because you're right. Um, you don't have endless money, endless resources, endless people, so you can't do it on everything. So what is the single most important program you have? And then um, you work with, as I said, I can give you a bunch of students or there are professionals out there who can help do this, um, to put in, to start doing the input and the interim measure and the output model. So number one, what's your most important program? Number two, what measures do I already have? As you think through it strategically, what am I already measuring? Am I measuring what I do? But am I measuring the result? Because the first thing an expensive consultant is going to say, something you can answer anyway, which is, have I got any measure at all of the result? Now, what do I actually want as a result? And is it feasible to measure it? So um, let's talk about measurement. So let's say it's a, it's a tracking study of some kind going to want to find out how many people I'll use the life literacy, uh, family literacy day as an example. Let's say actually I, I have no idea of what percentage of people I'm reaching are actually reading. Oh, does that mean a $100,000 sample survey um, of finding out? Uh, and the answer is ideally yes, but realistically no. So what might you do? Well, what you might do is take a region of the country not a Toronto, because it's too big and expensive, but let's say a smaller community where you've had some activity and you hire the, do it in a university town, and especially one with a business school 
or with a psychology department, anything that does measurements um, by telephone interviews or online interviews. And then you get them to help you design a questionnaire. Now, you can do it yourself. There are wonderful organizations like SurveyMonkey and people like that, um, where you can fairly cheaply get three or four questions out there with, with, with key people that you're targeting. But my recommendation realistically is you'll probably find if there's a local university in your area, it's got a business school or anything that measures behavior, um, you may be able to get a class to do it as a project. And I heartily recommend that. And I'm serious about that, by the way. Um, we at Shuley, and along with a whole bunch of other uh, business schools, are now emphasizing community engagement a lot more than we have in the past. And what we're expecting our students, both the undergrads, but particularly the MBAs, st to stop them doing Occupy Toronto kind of stuff, is to get engaged with communities, that, you know, the give back orientation. So you're going to get a whole bunch of faculty and students that might be interested in doing this. OK, great. We have a few more questions here. Um, what type of software program would one use to develop these graphs? Um, good question. Um, uh, if if uh, through Ontario Literacy, you can send them an email, um, then what I can do is to send you some contacts. Um, uh, it, it, the graphic packages that are available are, are quite cheap. Um, I, I don't have at my hand uh, what they are, but I will certainly send them. Okay, great. Yeah, and you can email me if you uh, if you want, allison at on.literacy.ca. And Allison. we'll be sending out an email with everything out after the uh, webinar so people can just get back that way. Great. Um, the next question is, what is the realistic time frame to gauge an objective or positive outcome or result? Boy, what a great group of questions. Um, ha, um, <laughs> it depends. <laughs> um, you will know when you're, you're dealing with programs whether strategically you wanted an immediate response because there's a tactical nature or something happening in, in the environment or something happening to your learners or to the organization that you want an instant response or a very quick response. Most of the stuff we do will have a longer term response and you, and you want to look at it cumulatively. And, and let me use Family Literacy Day as an example to know a little bit about it. I mean, as I said, it's been going since 1999. You know, one of the problems you've got with a one-off event is that out of sight, out of mind. By the time you finish in January, how much permanence does that program have on February through December? Yeah, not much. But we also know at ABC Life Literacy that there is some cumulative memory when it comes back. And you do it regularly. So did it have an impact year one? Yeah, to some extent, thanks to some wonderful sponsors. But it's gained in capability since then because you are to some extent accumulating. Now, am I saying you must have a uh, a, a minimum of 15 years to get it, the answer is no. But two lessons in the way of looking at it. Unless you're object you have lots of money and your objective is very short term, most of the stuff we're going to be doing will have a cumulative effect. So how long, very difficult question to ask, but the dashboard will help you because you'll be able to look at what you do on the same program and whether that is actually continually improving just a little bit, whatever your objectives are. Um, I, you can tell I'm ducking and weaving a little bit, and I apologize for that. But it, it, it is a very hard question. So my tip is be very clear. If you want very quick responses, either make sure you've got the budget or the resources to get a lot of awareness and, and associations amongst the people you're trying to get to, or look for ways of repeating it. Um, my last comment would be, most people in organizations get tired of doing the same thing 
before their target audience does. United Way of Toronto has been running its big push fundraising in the fall um, of the year for um, you know, 30, 40 years. Um, and that regularity really concentrates the capability of getting corporations on site. And, and don't look for new times, look for new ways of, of, of building greater awareness during that set period of time. Um, so consistency helps enormously. Okay, great. Um, I just want to remind people that if you do have a question, just to type it in the question pane in your dashboard. Um, I have, um, I think, more of a comment than a question here, but uh, out of, um, oh, sorry. It, as we move into a new funding model, this tool could be used to illustrate how performance ah. is tied to funding. We have new, uh, we have a number of inputs and, and drivers, statistics, that we have to access to, but it doesn't seem to be tied together. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes, deep sympathy for whoever asked that question. Um, yes, both the federal government and also the provincial government are playing around with the way funding policies can go. What it means is we will have to do two things as a sector. Um, we're going to have to demonstrate performance better, and secondly, we're probably going to have to reach out into broader fundraising communities in order to sustain our activity. Um, so it, it, it is a challenge. What the dashboard can help do is to begin to get those statistics, which are a lot about what we do, and to start pushing us to ask the question, what did it accomplish? And the more we can do that, and I, I'm going to stay away from any political comments because I'm going to get myself in deep trouble, other things being equal than relatively in Queen's Park or, or Ottawa, the more you can say your funding allowed us to do this, and by and not by the way, this is what doing it enabled us to do and succeed at in terms of the literacy challenges. The more we can do that from move from just what we're doing to the result of what we're doing, the better chance we've got to either hang on to um, what funding we've got, or using it as a base of going different funding. I know that sounds a bit naive. Apologies. I, I don't mean to make light of this or, or to be over naive. But the challenge, because of all the changes and questionnaire so acutely is asked, is to focus much more on what has been accomplished as a result of what we've done, rather than just what we've done. Okay, great answer. Um, out of sight, out of mind is a great analogy. If the life cycle of uh, the program or event is properly planned, for example, pre-promotion and post-event PR, et cetera, then that one day event can be extended. Agree or disagree? I totally agree. Um, there's a concept which I learned in my early in my marketing career called power marketing. And power marketing very simply means Never do something that only has one outcome. Always look for at least three. Um, use an example. You know, if you're going to have an event like Family Literacy Day, that's an event with everything around it. What two other things can you do to either extend its reach or its power during that day, or even better, to the question that you've asked? How do I extend the meaning of that? Oh, I'll give some examples. And by the way, don't hold ABC Life Literacy responsible for this. This is now just Middleton mouthing off. One of the things I might consider, and Margaret Eaton will kill me, but that's okay. I love her. Um, one of the things that you might be able to do is to do a survey, exactly as I've got on the screen, which is, what did we achieve in terms of the awareness and associations? And more important, a little sample. What kind of effect it had? And what we say is, do you realize that only 20% of the population, even after Family Literacy Day, were reading to their kids? Isn't that awful? Now, come on board sponsors, come on board literacy organizations, get behind, just don't do it for one day, do it regularly. Use the data 
for instance, that you might get by a good measure of the metrics to get out there and, and, and poke away at people about you know how serious the problem this is. Another way of, of doing it is coming out of the number of people who you did actually get doing the reading, interview them how easy it was to do. You know, it, to some extent, you know, this audience is going to hate me for this comment, but never mind. With people who have literacy challenges, it's a bit like telling this big fat person talking to you, i.e. me, Middleton, that I should be dieting and I should be doing much better. I know that. I know I should be being looking after myself better physically. Most parents know literacy is important. I really need that connection to the kids and it will improve them. But it's reaching over that intent to the behavior gap that becomes important. So maybe something else you could do with the results of Family Interest Day is, is a series of how people find, it, find the time to do it. You know, part of the problem with dieting is people don't know how to do it. Part of the problem with literacy challenge is where are I going to find the time? What kind of books? It's very threatening. Soften the process of how people do it. That could come out of it. So the question's brilliant because any one thing that you do, look for ways to extend it because that not only improves uh, that horrible word ROI um, in terms of the, the return from the effort, but it makes it more of an, an, an established presence and, and a bigger event. Great question. Love it. Mm -hmm. Great. We have time for uh, one more question here. Um, how does this work with non-academic outcomes, that is, the intangibles? Um, help me with the intangibles, like you mean staff motivation or... or I would assume something like that. You okay. didn't give her a it, is, it is measurable. <laughs> um, it, it does need, um, uh, you know, for instance, social media. You can actually measure buzz. You know, how many people are talking about you and what they're saying. So a lot of these things are measurable. You can break them down. Now, by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm no um, maniac about uh, math and measurement for everything. But the advantage of having the numbers and, and expressing them as numbers is you get trend lines and you begin to get this relationship, input to driver to output. So you can measure them. Those that are really tough, like, do my people in my organization feel better as a result of this? You know, that's measurable. Um, but never, never, I want to balance that, never, ever underestimate the importance of not only looking at the dashboard as numbers, but using it to go in and asking people questions one-on-one. -on -one. So one of the ways I use the dashboard would be, Oh, yeah, I know that happened in that period because we'd spent some money and we got really good awareness and a lot of people are reading to their kids. I'm not sure I understand why. Let me go back and find some people who did it and talk to them about why and get that qualitative, what I call the why as well as the what. Dashboards give you the what. They give it to you in a structured way. The real value, if it triggers, and this is behind the question, great question, if it triggers you to go in and find out why, and that's non-mathematical, um, non it gets people to talk about how it made them feel. So my real answer, you see I'm burbling like crazy, I'll eventually get to the answer, and the answer is use the dashboard to trigger what kind of qualitative follow-up and, and depth. Um, feeling about something um, that you want to find out. Okay, that's uh, you got great answer. So they were they must have been satisfied. Um, <laughs> okay, we're we're at two o'clock now, so we're out of time. Thank you so much, Alan. And I, the I hope I didn't, be... oh, hope I didn't okay. bore everybody to death. Um, <laughs> I hope I didn't make it make it sound too complex. It it does require that that that, that discipline input driver metric output. Uh, I think everyone found it uh, very informative. Um, so the OLC will be in touch soon with the slides. And uh, again, thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for attending. And for everybody, thanks, Alison, who stepped in at the last minute because poor Amber was ill. So Alison, <laughs> thank you.
Thank you, Alan. Thanks, everyone. Take care.